Hey there, Gary Hoover here again. Um, today I'm just going to show a few ideas that I had put up here on my whiteboard. I'd really been working on some ideas for some talks and things, and so this was just my own brainstorming, so it's kind of a toss salad of different ideas, but I thought before I raised the board at least I'd uh, record it. Um, so uh, there's three big ideas here. The first one is about how the world is now global. Now that's not exactly big news. I didn't exactly discover that. It's been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries if you read the history books. But the level to which we are all interconnected with each other around the globe is just greater than it's ever been before. When I was a kid and got interested in business in the uh, early 60s, um, I could have gone through my whole life and not even visited another country and probably been pretty successful at business. And of course, still big markets in the U.S. And if you've got a local restaurant or something, uh, you may not have to go abroad. Although you still get a better idea about how to design a restaurant and what kind of cuisine to have and stuff if you got a bigger view. But for most companies, um, you gotta do business with uh, Mexico and Canada and China and India and on and on and on and on all over the world. And you know, we're kind of. I drew it as a little globe here. You know. Uh, um, but I show it, it's, it's about them and about us, you know? It's about we're all interlinked. What goes around comes around, I guess is the way to say it. And that is a done deal. And that's why I put down here at the bottom the word is this is just reality. So I don't care if you love this, if you hate it, I think it would be really stupid to say, well, let's stop it, let's slow it down, or let's speed it up. It's a done deal. It's it's already happened. It's just going to happen more and more and more. And to the extent that we think of our, ourselves and our world on just a nation basis or a state or a city, and all those things are important. I write a lot and talk a lot about geography and in my book and everything. But man, it is one big world. And if you don't get that, and if you fight that, odds are against you. So that's the first big idea. The next big idea here is about the rise of the service economy. I, I did a separate little video blog post like this one on that a few weeks ago. The world economy today is 71% services. Agriculture, mining, oil and gas, manufacturing, industrial stuff, all that stuff combined is 29% of the world economy. And that's gone up a bunch over the last 20, 30 years and we are moving more and more to a service economy. But I would also, I would go so far as to say that the great, even manufacturing companies have a service mentality. That if we could all think like people that are trying to help other people out, trying to make our customers' lives better, we'd all be better off. But the heart of service, of serving others, whether you do it through manufacturing and making a better product or by delivering a service, health services, financial services, retail services, transportation services, energy services, any way you go, it's about others and about ourselves. And this is a common theme when I talk about and teach entrepreneurship is you've got to understand yourself and what you're good at and what you love to do, what your skills and passions are, but you've also got to study others. You have to be deeply, genuinely interested in the welfare of others and then figure out how that works together because it's like a yin and yang thing like I've drawn here. It, 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 it takes both. And in many ways, entrepreneurial process is an introverted and an extroverted process. It's a combination of your own highly personalized vision of the future and what do people really need and want, and how you bring that together. Steve Jobs may be the best case of having a very personal vision of the world, and yet it's something that other people love, works for everybody. Now what that leads to, if you serve others and find a way something they really want and that they or someone else is willing to pay for for them, could be a gift or college tuition or whatever, um, cost of a wedding, then that leads to prosperity. And here I've just defined a little bit prosperity is both spending and savings because we know our American savings rate is too low. I've been there and done that myself. Um, we need both. Because if we saved it all, we put it all in shoeboxes or whatever, and nothing, no good would come of it. At least we save it and put it in the bank account, somebody will borrow it, maybe. The banks let it out and create some jobs or something like that. But prosperity comes from serving others. And then over here, let me go this way. 
How do we make these things happen? Let's say we need a better postal system. Let's say we need to invent drugs to cure cancer. Let's say that we need to build highways. Let's say that we need a bet an energy efficient automobile. How do we do that? We do that through enterprise, human enterprise. An enterprise, and this can be for profit, not for profit. It can be government agency. I don't care. It's still an enterprise. It's still somebody saying, I want to do something that hadn't been done before. Let's try this. And an enterprise, when I was playing around, okay, I got this drawing and this drawing. And what's, what goes here? What's well, really a network? You know, and, and if you know me, I'm down on buzzwords and, and big on history, and don't, there's not a lot new invented. Well, the idea of an enterprise as a network goes way, way back. If you study the great business historian Alfred Chandler, he talks about the learning organization and how it really coordinates. Where does it buy stuff from? Who does it sell it to? It's a marketing machine. It's a supply machine. It's all these things going on. It's a network. It's got employees. It's got customers. It's got neighbors. It's got stockholders. And the, and the enterprise pulls all that together. And I don't know whether that's the board of directors or the CEO at the center or Really, maybe the customer should be at the center. But the enterprise is this network. And that's how we get things done. Because if you really study the globe over here, you're going to be studying geography. You're going to be traveling the world, learning what's going on around the world. You study service, you're going to be studying others and other individuals and what they need and everything, and also learn about yourself. You do the enterprise. This is like, OK, we know we need an energy efficient car. How do we get in? How do we organize people? How do we structure people? Do those people work for our company or are they outside consultants? Do we own our own factories or do we contract out for this stuff to be built? And, and so enterprise is involved with organization, execution, leadership, ideas like that. You know, how do you do it? How do you carry it out? And, and, and one thing about all these ideas is, they're all about people. You know, when I'm talking geography, I'm not talking so much uh, mountains and oceans, although those have a huge impact and those underlie everything we do. But I'm not just talking physical geography, I'm talking human geography. Service, us serving others, obviously is all about people. And this network is a human network. Yes, it takes capital, it takes technology, it takes machines, it takes uh, t container boxes, you know, shipping containers. It takes all kinds of stuff, skyscraper, skyscrapers. Uh, um, but it's a fundamentally a human enterprise. And I think that's just a, a core set of ideas, three key ideas everybody should put together. So those are a couple of my thoughts for today. I'll do a separate video to talk about some of the stuff I wrote along the edges here.